things that maybe I'm weird okay well I know I'm weird but one of the things that I like to do is I like to visit old cemeteries and I like to uh, look at what's written on tombstones because sometimes you can find very interesting and unusual things and sometimes you can find very uh, humorous kind of things look at some of these that I've picked out here we'll go through them one at a time this first one here Leslie Nielsen February 11th, 1926 to November 28th, 2010, letter rip. Do you ever remember him saying that? Yeah, it was a part of him. Okay, next one here. Mel Blanc. That's all, folks. All right. Beloved husband and father, 1908 to 1989. Next one. I was hoping for a pyramid. Good sense of humor there. Next one. Here lies John Yeast. Pardon me for not rising. That's clever, okay? All right, next one. This is in honor of my wife, okay? This lady says, destined to be a woman with too many cats. We've got four now, okay? So there you go, all right. And then this last one here. Merv Griffin, I will not be right back after this message you know as you as you look at tombstones think about it the tombstone reduces lives down to two dates and a dash in the middle i mean they may can they may contain some other items out there but in reality the whole of life comes down to two dates the date of birth and the date of death and what transpires between them. And so the whole of a person's life is represented by that dash. Uh, that dash tells their life. It's what they lived for. It's who they loved. It's um, what they were interested in, what motivated them, what drove them, what, uh, what it was that, uh, that their whole life was given to, what they were passionate about. It represents their greatest uh, failures, and their deepest regrets. All of life is reduced to a dash. And I think, you know, realize that none of us had control over where and when we were born. And for most of us, I would say for the vast majority of us, we're not going to have any control over where and when we die. But we do have some control over the dash of our life, over how our life is played out between the time of our birth and the time of our death. We have some control over that. Uh, you, you and I get to choose how we spend that little dash in our life and what we make of that dash. And so the question that, that I want us to wrestle with this morning is, how are you spending your dash? Are, are you really living the dash knowing fully well who you are and what your purpose is in this world, or are you dashing to live? I mean, hurriedly spending 
precious time pursuing things that in the end really don't matter much at all. So we're beginning this whole new series on one month to live. It's kind of 30 days to a no regrets kind of life. <clears throat> and during the next weeks, we're going to be asking a, a very sobering question, and that is, what would you do if you found out that you only had one month to live? How would your life be different? How would you act differently? Uh, how would you live out these final days? Because most of us probably don't want to know the date of our final day here on earth. I don't, I don't think we want to know that. But for the next six weeks, I'm going to challenge us to think that way. To think, I only have 30 days to live. And my prayer is that we're going to gain attitudes and we're going to gain um, uh, lifestyle behaviors or whatever that will help us to live with absolutely no regrets. Uh, think about it. If you knew that you had one month to live, it would radically change your life. You would do things totally different in, in your life. And so why is it that we wait until we're diagnosed with cancer or we have a loved one who dies before we develop that kind of mindset? Um, don't we really want to live all that life has to offer? Don't we want to live out the full purpose for which God created us? Um, wouldn't life be a whole lot satisfying if we lived with the idea that I may not have tomorrow? And I need to make the most of today. And so during the next several weeks, we're going to discover four universal principles that will really help us to answer this question and transform it from what would you do if you only had one month to live into a lifestyle of meaning and, and living for purpose. These uh, four principles that I'm going to mention, these four truths, can be seen in the life of Jesus Christ. Now, have you ever thought about the fact that there came a point in Jesus' life when he knew that he had only one month to live? That he knew there was only 30 days left until the cross. And so what did he do when he knew he only had one month to live? I mean, from his life, we're going to discover four principles <clears throat> that uh, will enable us to really live the dash rather than just dashing to live, okay? Um, he, he lived passionately, he loved completely, he learned humbly, and he left boldly. Look at what, uh, what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10. It's in your notes there, but it's here on the screen as well. Jesus said this, he says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. See, that's the way that Jesus lived his life while he was here on this earth. And so here are four, what I would call universal principles to live life by. Uh, four ways in which he lived that you and I need to live in our own life. It, so that we can live the kind of life that God made us for. So the very first principle is this, that Jesus lived passionately. <clears throat> Jesus lived passionately. Go back there to, to John 10.10 10 and... And, and take note of, or may, if in your notes there, you might want to even underline the words life abundantly. Maybe your life right now stinks, okay? Some of us would admit that. Or maybe your life right now is really, really good. God wants you to live an abundant life where you're fully who he made you to be where you're carrying out all the purposes that he has given to your life. God desires for you a better life all, all together. And in fact, 1 John chapter 5 really spells out what that life is all about. 1 John 5, beginning at verse 11, the writer says this, And this is what God has testified. He has given us <clears throat> eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. And whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. See, the Apostle John here is saying that we have a clear-cut choice uh, to make. And, it, and, you know, it's either a life where we're just existing and that, and we're just getting by, or, he says, you're living the kind of life that you were made to live, that you were created to live. 
I'm talking about real living here, not just existing, okay? Uh, but here's the important thing. To live that kind of life, look what he says. You must have the Son of God. You must have the Son of God. So what we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks is perhaps the greatest adventure of your life. It will be the greatest opportunity for spiritual growth. It will be the, the greatest experience of of spiritual blessing. It will be the greatest chance that you have to impact the lives of other people. But it really comes down to the choice that you make. The choice that you make to live the life that you were made to live. Now, whether you realize it or not, Satan doesn't want us to have that kind of life. And so uh, Satan is not going to come to you folks and whisper in your ear and saying, hey, don't take that life that God has to offer. Take my life instead because it's far more miserable and it's what you really want to do. Satan's not going to do that. You know what Satan does? He comes to us and he says, you know, God's offer really is pretty good. You know, you ought to maybe take that offer, but not today. Someday, but, but not today. Do that some other day, okay? Um, Maybe you're thinking about becoming a Christian. Maybe you're thinking about committing your life to Jesus Christ. And you think, yeah, that's what I really need to do. I need to commit my life to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And Satan is going to say, yeah, you know what? You really should do that. That really it should be something that you ought to do, but not today. Do it someday. Someday down the road. Someday you can commit your life to Christ, but don't do it today. Today's not a good day for you. Or, or maybe you're a believer, and, and you're saying, you know, I really need to sell out to Jesus Christ. I need to totally surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I really need to get involved in church. I need to really get involved in doing the Lord's work. That's something I really need to do. And Satan's going to say, yeah, you know what? That's a pretty good idea. You ought to do that. You ought to just get, get involved in God's work, and, and, but not right now. Your life's too busy right now. Don't, don't, don't do that yet. Someday you'll have time to do it. Someday, maybe when you retire or whatever, you can do that. You see, God's favorite word is today. Satan's favorite word is someday. Someday. And we get stuck, folks, in that someday syndrome. We think that, you know, someday when I get settled down, I'm really going to live for God. Someday, when, you know, when this problem is out of my life, then I'm really going to be happy. Someday, when all this business that I'm in and all the pressures of work is going to subside, and then I'll really spend more time with the children. Someday, I'm going to get that promotion. I'm going to make better money. And then we'll really be happy. We'll really start living. Folks, when are we going to wake up and realize that Right now is life. It's beautiful and it's wonderful and it's painful and it's frightening and it's awe-inspiring all at the same time. But this is life. But man, we're constantly waiting to live. I'm, someday I'm going to really live. We think that someday it will really happen. Folks, that's all false. This is all you've got right now, this day. This is your life. Folks, Life moves so very, very fast. And it's gone before you know it. It is a precious, sacred gift that God gives you. And so you've got to make the choice to make the most of every moment. I mean, it seems like only yesterday that I was holding my daughter in my arms in the hospital after she was born. And now she's grown and has grown daughters of her own. Where did my youth go? All of us age. We age so rapidly. Speaking of that, I found a, a kind of a monologue by a comedian that I really liked. He said this. Do you realize that the only time in our lives when we like to get old is when we're kids? If you're less than 10 years old, you're so excited about getting older. And you think of it in fractions. How old are you? I'm Four and a half years old, you know. Uh, folks, you're never 36 and a half. All right? Just the face about it. But you're four and a half and you're going on five. That's the key there. 
He says, you get into your teens, and now they can't hold you back. You jump to the next number, even a few ahead, you know. How old are you? Well, I'm going on 16. You may be 13 years old, but you're going on 16. And then comes the greatest day of your life. You become 21. Those words almost sound like a ceremony, don't they? You become 21. But yes, and then you turn 30. Ooh, what happened there? You turned 30. Sounds like soured milk. You know, he turned on us and we threw him out, okay? Um, you turn 30 and then you're pushing 40. Whoa, put on the brakes. It's all slipping away. Before you know it, you reach 50 and your dreams are gone. But wait, you make it to 60. You didn't think you would, but you make it. So you, you become 21, you turn 30, you push 40, you reach 50, and you make it to 60. You build up so much speed that before you know it, you hit 70. And after that, it's a day-to-day -day thing, okay? You hit Wednesday. Uh, you, you know, you get into your 80s, and every day is a complete cycle. You hit lunch, you turn 4.30, you reach bedtime, and it doesn't end there. When you get into your 90s, you start going backwards. Uh, you know, I'm 92, and then this strange thing happened and I'm 100. And at that point, he says, you become a kid, little kid again. I'm 100 and a half. Don't you love that? You know, I, I really hope that all of us live to be 100 and a half, okay? But even if you do, folks, life flies by so very fast. And you just keep, keep going back quicker and quicker and quicker. And we need to understand that these years are very precious things. So we need to stop constantly waiting to live and start living, uh, living the life that, that you were created to, to live. Look at, at what Jesus says here in Luke chapter 7 and verse 31. He's talking about his generation. He says this, to what can I compare the people of this generation? Jesus asked, how can I describe them? They're like children playing a game in the public square. They complain to their friends. We played wedding songs and you didn't dance. So we played funeral songs and you didn't weep. See, Jesus is saying, we're playing the music of life for you, but you didn't dance. You didn't enjoy life. You were always waiting to live. And then when the pain and the problems got in your way, you didn't cry. You, you didn't experience life. You, you tried to avoid all risks at all costs. That is, you, you didn't live. He says, I put you on this earth and gave you the most sacred gift of all, the gift of life, and you didn't use it. You didn't live. Folks, we're always waiting to live. I think we vastly overestimate the power of tomorrow. And we get stuck in this someday syndrome. And then <clears throat> we vastly over estimate the power of yesterday and we get stuck in our guilt and our past regrets folks we've got to learn to live today one day at a time a motivational speaker and pastor john maxwell has this little sign in his office that simply says yesterday ended last night and, and what that means is that reminds him that no matter how badly i failed in the past that's done, and today is a new day. No matter what goals I accomplished, they have little impact on what I'm going to do today. That's the power of today. So we need to start living. We need to choose to start living and taking the risk. And you know what? The greatest risk is not risking at all. So Jesus lived passionately. There's a second risk that, that you and I face, and that's the risk of loving because you and I were made to love and so the second principle there is Jesus loved completely uh, <clears throat> look at what Jesus did when he knew that he had just a short period of time with his disciples John 13 verse 1 before the Passover celebration Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and to return to the Father <clears throat> He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. You know, if you knew that you had only one month to live, 
you would probably live your life differently. You would say some things to some people that you need to say to them. You would do some things for people that, that you would like to do for them. You would focus on your relationships. You would express love to those who were very closest to you. You know, it, it sounds simple, but it's really profound. The reason that you were placed on this earth is simply you were placed to love. And you're never living until you're loving. Jesus summed up the whole Bible, really, in these words uh, from Matthew chapter 22, beginning at verse 37. Look what he says. Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is, we're to love God wholeheartedly, and we're to love our neighbors unselfishly. That's what he's saying here. You see, at the end of your life, it doesn't matter how much money you've earned. It doesn't matter how many rewards that you have received. It doesn't matter how many goals you've achieved. All that matters is, did you love? Did you love the people in your life? Did you love God wholeheartedly? That's the only thing that's going to matter one day. You know, if, if you knew that you were going to, to, that this month was going to be the last month of your life, that, that you were going to die at the end of this month, how would you live your life? Would it change the way you related to people? I think it would. I, I think it would really focus on relationship. Your relationship with God and growing in, in your understanding of Him and being prepared to meet Him, but also growing in your relationship with your family and, and your friends. You, want to, you would want to make a lasting legacy on those that you leave behind. So here's my challenge to you. Learn to start living your life as if this was your last month here on earth. Then at the end of this month, what you're going to discover is what it really means to have lived life the way it should be lived. Now, by the way, love is not some kind of syrupy feeling, okay? Love is an action. Love is a choice. You live out your love toward other people. So let me ask you, today, to whom do you need to say, I love you? To whom do you need to show love? Um, let me encourage you to do that because all the flowers that you might send to a funeral cannot make up for the fact that you should have said, I love you to somebody. Um, because love is not love until you get it away. You've heard that before, and it's true. It's true. So who is it that you need to give love away to today? Um, who needs to hear from you those words? I love you. You're important to me. God placed you on this earth to love, and you're never going to live until you love. It's interesting that Jesus showed the full extent of his love to his disciples by doing a very simple act. He washed their feet. Over the next six weeks, I want to challenge you to think of some simple ways that you can make a big statement to somebody concerning how you feel about them. Um, a minor change can make a major difference in letting somebody know that you really love them. So Jesus loved completely. And then third principle is that Jesus learned humbly. He learned humbly. You know, even though Jesus was God, <coughs> he taught us by his own example to learn humbly. Look at these great words from Philippians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul writes and he says this, you must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Uh, look there in, in your notes or on the screen or whatever, Look at that phrase, and you might want to even underline it. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Just a, a few pages later in the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is going to tell us that Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. J Jesus learned humbly 
even though he was God. I mean, think about it. He could have remained in heaven with all his splendor and all that glory because he was God himself. And yet, he humbled himself and he became a man and he took upon himself the, the, the form of a servant, the very nature of a servant, and he became obedient unto death on a cross. Paul is writing this verse <clears throat> to challenge us to do the same thing as Christ did. He says, be more like Christ. And what I'm talking about here really is character building. You realize that the only thing that you're going to take to heaven when you die is your character. You're not going to be able to take anything else, but you will take your character to heaven. And so this earth is preparation ground where God is building your character to make us more like himself. Uh, and, and folks, there are two things that build your character. <clears throat> One of them, of course, is the word of God. Digging into the word of God and learning the word of God in your life. And the second thing that builds our character is problems. Problems in our life. Now, I like the word of God a whole lot better than problems. I don't know about you, but I do. Um, but I believe that these next few weeks in this study can be one of the greatest blessings in your life. But I also want to warn you, this could be a period of some of the greatest problems in your life because Satan does not want to you to benefit from this study. And he's going to do whatever he can to, to mess you up. Some of the greatest blessings, though, in our lives come disguised as problems. And so some of you are going to be going through, if you're not right now, through some of the most difficult period of problems in your life that you've ever gone through. See, life moves on two tracks. I mean, the great things happen in my life and tough things happen in my life. And oftentimes they're happening simultaneously at the, at the same time. So every one of us have problems. Folks, if you've got a pulse, you've got problems. Don't fool yourself, okay? Every one of us have painful things going on in our lives. If not right now, Watch out, they're going to happen real quickly. But here's the good news. Those problems can't stop God's plan for your life. Uh, in fact, God wants to use those problems to make you more like Jesus Christ, like his son. Um, and, and so he's building character for our good. That's what God is doing. So, you know, often though in our problems, what do we say to God? We say, oh God, please take these problems out of my life. And you know what God says to us? No, I'm going to bring you through the problem. Uh, you and I are crying out to God, oh God, you know, change my circumstances. And God says, no, I'm going to change you. That's what I want to do. And that's so much better when God changes us because we become more and more like his son, Jesus Christ. And so you allow God to help you work through those problems by turning to him, by digging into God's word, and it'll be the greatest adventure that, that you'll ever find in life. Uh, the writer of Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 6, says this. This is the New Living Translation. It says, Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. You might want to underline or, or at least focus in on those words, which path to take. In some translations, such as the, the King James Version, this phrase is, interpreted, is translated as success. But the Hebrew word is so different than our understanding of the word success. It's not talking about monetary success here or financial success or business success, anything like what we would think. Uh, the word for success here in this passage in the Hebrew literally means the ability to make wise decisions. And that's what we need more than anything else in life. Isn't that true? The ability to make wise decisions. Um, because for everything in life, man, we need that ability to make wise decisions. Because you and I are going to face some tough decisions in our life. And we need the ability to make wise decisions in our family, in our relationships, in our employment, in our finances, all of these kinds of things. So do you need the ability to make wise decisions in your life? Look what it says. Seek God's will in all you do. That simply means put God first in your life. Let me give to you some really practical advice of some things that you can do to put God first in your life. You might want to write these down, post them somewhere in your house so that you can review them 
regularly. But four things that I would say really will help you to put God first. Number one, if you want to put God first in your life, give God the first day of every week. Give God the first day of every week. You know, God tells us, make a day out of your week where you focus on me. Make, that, make me the priority and make that day the priority of your week. I'm talking about one day where you put God first. Now, we talked last Sunday about the fact that for most of us, that would be Sunday. But because of shift work and all sorts of, of, of things, Sunday may not be the day when you can focus on God because you're working that day. But find a day during that week where you can focus on God because what that does is that helps you recalibrate your life and, and your priorities. When you give God the first day of the week or a day in the week, he's going to bless all the other days. And then second, give God the first part of every day. Give God the first part of every day. That is, spend the first 10, 15, 20 minutes of the day reading from God's Word, maybe writing down what God is revealing to you, um, praying about what's coming up on your day. You know, sometimes I, I tell God that um, I'm too busy. I can't, I can't get to this. Uh, I, I'm too busy. And then I realized, no, I've got to spend time with God. And when I do that, God just seems to elongate the day. I get more accomplished when I put him first in my day when I start. He blesses the rest of my day. So put God first in your day. And then third, give God first place in your life by giving him the first part of your income. That is, put God first. And, you know, give the first part back to him. We call it the 10%, the tithe. You know, if God is not first place in your finances, then God's not first place in your life, bottom line. And then finally, give him the first consideration in every decision. Give him the first uh, consideration in every decision. Have you ever um, bought a car without praying about it? It was a lemon, right? Well, I mean, really, God wants you to pray about every single thing in your life. Everything, every decision that you make. God wants to be first in every decision. He wants you to pray about everything in your job, in your family, in your relationship. You need to pray about it. And, and when we ask God, God gives us the ability to make wise decisions. So you are made to live passionately, you are made to love completely, and you are made to learn humbly. And then the fourth principle is this. We're to leave boldly. Principle number four, Jesus left boldly. See, not only did he live passionately and love completely and learn humbly, but he left this earth boldly. He was resolute on his mission on earth. Uh, he knew why he was here. I love uh, that passage in, in Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Look at this sense of urgency here. It says, as the time drew near for him to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely, you see that word? Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. See, there's, there's no hesitation here. There's no reservation here at all with Jesus. He was <laughs> resolute in fulfilling the purpose for which he had come. If you knew that you only had 30 days to live, you wouldn't waste time or your energy on things that really didn't matter, would you? But you would look for ways to leave a legacy. You would, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you would prepare for eternity because you would realize this earth is not my home. Something far better awaits me out there. Because, folks, there's just something in us that tells us that life is more than just here and now. We, we realize that inherently. Uh, we, we were made to leave. We were made for eternity. We were made to leave a legacy. I think one of the greatest barriers, folks, from us that keep us from leaving a legacy is this fact that we try to please everyone else. Uh, we, we try to live our lives for everybody else's approval. We want people's approval. And it robs us of the urgency of living. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells a parable 
about giving talents to, to, um, to his three servants. In that day and time, a talent was a sum of money. And so in verse 23, he comes back and there's an accounting of what they did with the money that was given to them. And in verse 23, it says, The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. You know, there are a lot of people out there who want to tell us how to live. But folks, at the end of life, there's only one opinion that really matters. That's that audience of one. That's our Heavenly Father who says, Well done, faithful servant. See, God is not going to look at you. And he's not going to say to you, well, why weren't you more like Pastor Sam? Or, or why weren't you more like Billy Graham? Or why weren't you more like this guy or that gal? No, instead, God is going to say, why didn't you live the life that I gave you to live? Why didn't you, why didn't you be who I made you to be? See, what I want God to say to me more than anything else is, well done. When I come to the end of the life, to hear him say, Sam, you know what? You sure didn't have it all together. And you made a lot of mistakes in life, but I'll grant you this. You were full of you. you. You lived out exactly the way in which I made you to be. And that gave me pleasure. Well done, a good and faithful servant. The story is told of a high school football player who was a, I wasn't really good football player. He was second team and second team linebacker and rarely got to play in the games. Uh, he played on kickoffs, and then if, if his high school team was really, really far ahead, he would go into the game with the scrubs toward the end of the game. Um, and that's about all he got to play. But it was the last game of his senior year, and he ran into the coach's office and he says, Coach, you've got to let me start tonight. You've got to let me start tonight. I've got to start tonight. And, and over and over again, just pleading with the coach, let me start tonight, let me play, let me start tonight. The coach says, I can't make any promises. Now, this boy's father came to every game, and even though his son didn't play, or rarely played, his father was at every game cheering him on, cheering the team on. He was like every other father who came to see his son play. The only difference was his father was blind. So he never got to see his son play, but he was always there cheering him on. Well, finally, as game time approached, the young man kept begging the coach, put, let me play, let me start, let me start the game. The coach told him, okay, I'm going to put you in for the first series, and that's it. So he was all pumped up, really fired up, and he went into the game. First play, the opposing team handed the ball off to the fullback, and this young linebacker stepped into the hole and smacked him for a loss. Second play, the quarterback uh, dropped back to pass, and this young quarter, uh, this linebacker was blitzing, and, and he tackled him for a huge loss. And so the coach left him in for the entire game, and he played the game of a lifetime. I had over 20 tackles. And at the end of the game, as he was leaving the field, the coach came over and grabbed him by the helmet and says, what just happened? He said, I just saw the most spectacular play by a high school linebacker that I've ever seen in my life. What happened? And the young man says, well, coach, you know my dad comes to every game and, and he's blind and never saw me play? Well, he died last night. And this is the first game that he's seeing me play. And I was playing for him. And it made all the difference in the world. Who are you playing for? Are you playing for the toys and the possessions of life? Are you playing for the financial acumens of the world? Are you playing for the, the approval of others? Who, who are you playing for? Are you playing for people to pat you on the back and say, add a boy, add a girl? Or are you playing for the one who matters most? The one who made you, the coach who made you and put you in the game, your heavenly father. Who are you playing for? See, he's the only one that really matters. So during these next six weeks, I'm going to urge you to take this challenge. Today we've kind of looked at the introduction but the next, next week, we're going to be looking in detail at those four different principles 
of how you'd live if you had only one month left to live so that you come to the end of the life with no regrets whatsoever. Here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. Two things, okay? Number one, every single day for the next 30 days, ask the question, what would I do if I had only one month to live? You get up in the morning, what would I do if I only had 30 more days to live? It will change the way you think. It will change the way you live. And then the second thing, uh, Jan, hand me that book right there. Sorry, I'm going off camera for those of you on camera. Thank you. We have for sale out in the lobby the book, One Month to Live, by Carrie and Chris Shook. Um, I want to challenge you to pick up a book. They're $10. You can get them as we go out. Um, starting next week, not this week, but starting next Sunday, we're going to read one chapter a day. There are 30 chapters. They're like daily devotionals. There's a place in here to journal to write down the ways in which God is changing your thinking and changing your life. And so that's the second thing. So first, ask the question, what would I do if I only had one month to live? And then get the book. If we run out today, we'll buy some more, okay? Uh, but do this. This is 30 days to a no regrets kind of life. You know, the fact of the matter is that you are never ready to live until you're ready to leave. So are you ready to leave? I mean, if you were to die tonight, do you know for certain that you would go to heaven? Are you ready to leave? Um, the bottom line is not so much that I'm worried that you're going to die tonight without Jesus Christ. But what I'm more concerned is you're going to wake up tomorrow morning without God. And you're going to have to face life. And that's tough. Do you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? This is a great day to begin a relationship with him. To say, you know what, if I only had 30 days left to live, I want to live it in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Let me pray for us, and then I'm going to uh, let you pray with me, and uh, then we'll, we'll close. Let's pray. Father... Without you, we are absolutely nothing. Life is meaningless. It's like spinning in a circle over and over and over again. But with you, life takes on new meaning, new direction. And we want to live a life where we don't end up with regrets. Saying, oh, I wish I'd done this. I wish I'd done that. And it starts by making sure, Jesus Christ, that you are the Savior, the Lord of our life. So I pray that today that you, through your Holy Spirit, would speak deep into our hearts to show us our relationship with you. Do we know you as Lord and Savior? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let me just ask, has there ever been a time in your life when you have invited Christ to be the Savior of your life? When you've turned your life over to him, you've asked him to forgive you of your sin, you've uh, made that decision to live for him from that day forward. If there's never been that time in your life, why not do that today? Why not use this moment right now to simply pray this prayer in your heart with me? <laughs> to say, dear Jesus, I know that you love me. You love me so much that you died for me. And I have lived my life in such a way that denied that you even exist. And as a result of that, there is a sin barrier between me and you. And there's nothing I can do to tear that barrier down. But you took, the, you, you took care of that need. You came and you died on the cross to forgive me of my sin and to give me an opportunity to live life to the very fullest. So I ask you today, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of the wrong in my life. Set me in a new direction of living for you and walking with you. <clears throat> I ask you to come into my heart right now. And as best as I know how, I want to live for you from this day forward. In your name I pray. If you pray that prayer, Grab that connection card. Those of you online, just make sure you've got it up or need to get it up again, just do it. 
And on that, just say, hey, today I pray to receive Christ. If your name is there, a phone number is there, or an email address is there, I can get in touch with you and help you to know what's the next steps that you need to take in following Jesus Christ. Folks, there's nothing more important than a relationship with God through Jesus Christ because without that, nothing else matters. If you had only one month to live, why not do it correctly and live with Jesus Christ in your life?